be talking about some of the biochemical pathways that go on in our body that are especially related to sports performance, fitness, health, stuff like that. So um, we're gonna keep it pretty basic today, but we just wanna introduce you to some of these concepts, even though they might seem a little uh, deep and stuff like that. We're gonna keep it as basic as possible, but just so we can familiarize ourselves with some of the ways that the body works. So um, the first pathway that uh, we should probably touch on is the phosphocreatine ATP system. Um, that is our body's highest energy output system. So that's done, we've talked about before, with when you're running sprints or performing like a one rep max or something like that. And the reason why it is such a high energy output system is because it's actually a very simple uh, reaction taking place. And so what we're doing is we're taking a molecule, molecule of phosphocreatine and really we're taking an ADP molecule, the enzyme uh, creatine phosphokinase is going to come in and what it's going to do is it's going to take this phosphate group, apply it on to this molecule of ADP to create a molecule of ATP. And so it's a really simple process. It's just a simple little reaction and that's going to be able to generate ATP very quickly because it is such a simple reaction. The issue with this here though is that we have a limited store of phosphocreatine in our muscles and so although it does generate ATP very quickly and rapidly for you know energy output, we're gonna run out of that phosphocreatine pretty quickly. Within 10 to 12 seconds, you know, our whole supply will be gone. But then our body regenerates it very quickly. So ATP, phosphocreatine system, boom. Our body's main energy, um, our body's main source of energy is gonna come from glucose. And so the way we get energy from glucose is by a process called glycolysis. And so what happens is a series of chemical reactions take place and for each molecule of glucose you're actually going to get two molecules of ATP and a molecule of pyruvate. And so the ATP, boom, we can use that for energy right away. But also once we have this pyruvate, in certain conditions that are anaerobic, that pyruvate is going to actually get converted into lactate. And so that lactate needs to get, get rid of our body because it's toxic in our in our muscles and stuff and so what what we do is that lactate gets sent to the liver which is where it can get con converted right back to pyruvate and so this little process another simple one is called the core cycle and it's just the process of converting lactate back to pyruvate and so the opposite of glycolysis is going to be called gluconeogenesis right so this was break glycolysis was breaking down glucose into energy what we're doing here is taking pyruvate and we're building it up into glucose, right? And we're converting it into glucose. What happened, this is really taking place when our bodies are in a starving state, right? So there's not much glucose in the blood. Our bodies uh, send out hormones and signals that generate uh, glucose from pyruvate. And this is actually gonna be an energy uh, consuming process, right? And so you think like, oh, if you're starving, why are you gonna use more energy? But the reason why is because we, our body needs to use glucose for energy, especially the brain. And so it, even though it costs energy, our bodies need the glucose. And so if we're low on glucose, we're going to use pyruvate, use that energy to create glucose so that we can run more, glyco or more glycolysis and create the energy from that, right? So going back to, so once we have that pyruvate from the end of glycolysis, that pyruvate is going to get sent over to the citric acid cycle. And so Citric acid cycle is gonna be a series of reactions. So that pyruvate gets converted into acetyl-CoA, and then that series of reactions takes place with certain substrates, you know, kind of being created at certain steps in it. But this is always just constantly running in our bodies, right? So if this stops running, we die. This is always running, but so what happens is we're gonna get three molecules of NADH, a molecule of FADH2, and some other ones that we're not gonna really talk about right now. But so these are the useful molecules right here, the NADH and the FADH2, okay? So after, you know, after citric acid cycle, you have these molecules of NADH, FADH, they kind of get um, used in the electron transport chain. And so with the electron transport chain, what we have here is four kind of protein complexes across the mitochondrial membrane in the cell. And so the molecule of NADH gets shunted into uh, complex one. And so at each step across at each complex, what we're gonna have is protons pushed across the membrane onto, one, onto this side. And so 
it's going to create an electrochemical gradient, which then we'll see down the line, but is going to create ATP because of that gradient. So, so NADH comes in at complex one, FADH actually jumps in at complex two. So it skips complex one, which will be big down the line. We'll talk about that. And so each step, they, you know, the protons get pushed across until you create this, this high energy gradient. So what happens then is like at the end of this, a process called oxidative phosphorylation takes place. And so with oxidative phosphorylation, we've built up all these protons on one side of the membrane, right? There's a ton of them, boom, it's very positive. And so they wanna be moving towards the negative side of the membrane, right? That's just the nature of how they'll move. And so what happens is we actually, it's really cool. We have this little molecule in our body. It's actually like a wind turbine, like it's, it's generating energy by spinning. And so what happens is as the protons get pushed across the membrane, they turn this little pump, and as that pump turns, it generates ATP. So for each one third of a turn, one ATP is produced. And so if we see here, NADH comes in, there's four, four and two protons for each molecule of NADH, so that's gonna be 10 protons. So that's gonna create three turns, right? Because there's three protons per turn. And so that's gonna create three turns. So one NADH is gonna make, make three ATPs, and because FADH2 skips uh, complex one, it's gonna create less protons on one side of the gradient. So for each FADH2, you're gonna get two ATPs, right? And so it's crazy how all these kind of steps are related. So you start with glucose, and, and, that's, and that's how we make so many ATPs, is this long series of events is gonna eventually lead to protons getting pumped across and ATP getting generated. This is where a lot of the ATP comes from. Okay, and then so a, a couple of final pathways that we wanna talk about here are fatty acid synthesis and degradation. So with fatty acid synthesis, we're gonna start with a substrate called citrate. It actually is one of the first substrates in the citric acid cycle, which if you think about it, if we have a lot of energy coming in, so we're consuming a lot of food, then we're gonna be making a lot of citrate because the citric acid cycle is gonna be running a lot, right? So, so we're in a high energy state, citrate's being created a lot. This gets turned into acetyl-CoA through an enzymatic reaction that gets turned into malonyl-CoA, and the malonyl-CoA then gets turned into palmitate. Palmitate is like the main building block of like all our fatty acids that we make in our body. So they all become palmitate, and then from there, the palmitic acid can get turned into short-chain, long-chain fatty acids by either breaking them down smaller or building up longer. So that's kind of how the fatty acid synthesis works. And then fatty acid degradation is a different process. So um, when we're in degradation, fatty acid degradation, we're gonna be in like a, uh, like a starving state, right? So our body needs energy, so we're gonna take from our fat stores. So we're taking stored fat and we're breaking it down, right? So a, a hormone that signals um, starving state like epinephrine or glucagon, that might come, that's gonna come in and it's gonna signal CAMP to then go activate an enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase. This hormone sensitive lipase is gonna break down the triglyceride into free fatty acids, right? So now we have free fatty acids, smaller molecules. These go through a four step process called beta oxidation, enzymatic reactions taking place. And so then that gets turned into acetyl-CoA. And then the acetyl-CoA, we'll see, you know, it's, it's kind of a common thing, right? We see it a lot, acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is like the main, you know, currency of like energy in our body, it's crazy. So then the acetyl-CoA gets, run back through the citric acid cycle and all this takes place again. And so then it's creating a lot more ATP, right? So degradation that's going in place when you need um, energy for your body. So how does this all like kind of apply to what we're talking about with our bodies? And really what you need to know is that like really the citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, chain oxphos, these are all like always taking place. They're constantly running and like they need to be happening. Whereas the phosphocreatine, ATP system, glucose, gluconeogenesis, fatty acid synthesis and degradation, those are all gonna be altered by like what we're doing throughout the day, right? So if we're eating, you know, sugar is getting put into our body, then glucose, glycolysis is gonna be running and stuff like that. If we're starving, then, oh, okay, then we're gonna run some gluconeogenesis to create the glucose to make ATP. And then also over here, right? So if we're eating, we're gonna be building up fat, right? We have excess amount of, um, molecules and calories and stuff being coming in, so we're gonna be building up fat, and if we're in a starving state, then we're gonna be breaking down fat, right? So all, all, 
these processes over here are going to be taking place based on what you're doing throughout the day. And then exercise, sports, working out, all those things are also going to, you know, signal hormones and that's really going to affect how these processes are running too. All right, so it's a lot to take in. I kind of ran through it really fast, but we're going to kind of be hitting on these processes as we go moving forward and stuff. And so we wanted to introduce you guys to a lot of these concepts now. Um, and we'll probably touch on them more in depth as we go, but this was like a nice little introduction for you guys. So hopefully it kind of made a little bit of sense. Um, and if you guys like the video, go ahead and like, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks.